good to be in the house of the Lord today with, uh, with our church family. It's, uh, it's a delight to be able to worship together. And um, I, uh, I know a lot of you guys are, are asking what comes after Jeremiah. Well, I'm going to finish Jeremiah this Sunday of Labor Day, and then, uh, and then I want to give you a heads up that we are diving into the book of Revelation starting in September. And so um, I asked uh, staff this week if I was crazy or, or brave, and, uh, and I got both answers. And so, so uh, yes, yes. So, uh, so we're going to dig into the book of Revelation. I know a lot of you guys like to order those scripture journals and things like that. And uh, um, I'm going to just tell you, I'm not going to approach it like it is on Facebook. So, uh, so I'm not going to be throwing up any political memes or anything like you get on Facebook. And so, uh, so we're going to approach it from a biblical standpoint, not a political one. Uh, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, our world is losing its ever-loving mind. And so the more it loses its mind, the more I long for home. And uh, the best way to uh, prepare ourselves for home is to dig into the book that, uh, that paints the picture for us. So we're going to do that starting, uh, starting in September. I'm looking forward to that. And um, it's going to be exciting. So, uh, so go ahead and, and, and get ready uh, because we're going to go from Jeremiah to Revelation. And, uh, and we will have, a, uh, we'll have all the judgment we can handle in, uh, in the last, uh, last two sermon series. Um, so I'd only been a pastor for a couple of years and things weren't going well. And maybe you've been in one of those seasons where things just weren't going well in your life. The, your career wasn't working right, family wasn't going like you wanted it to, and, and it was just one of those seasons for me where, where just ministry was kind of in one of those, uh, maybe, maybe the, the language that uh, you might hear today is just kind of mid, is, is how things were feeling. It was just kind of mid. And uh, I got out of seminary with super high hopes and higher expectations, and it didn't really unfold the way that, that I thought it would. And... I had no idea that God actually had better things in store for me, but this was a low spot. And in that low spot, I was really truly looking to see if there was anything, anything, anywhere that was better. And I was misled to think that the grass is greener on the other side. And maybe you've thought that before, that the grass is greener on the other side, but if you've ever thought that, there's a really important part of that sort of analogy that you need to understand. Green grass is still grass. And it doesn't matter if it's greener grass or less green grass. Green grass is still grass, and it still grows. It still needs mowing. It's still itchy if you roll around in it. Green grass, regardless of how green it is, is still just grass. And so you may think the grass is greener, but I promise you, you're going to have to take your lawnmower with you when you go find that greener grass. So in that low place, not knowing what to do, I decided that I needed to send my resume uh, out just to see if there was anything better. And I decided I was going to send my resume to places that sounded like cool places to live. Now, admittedly, that was not the most spiritual pathway forward to, uh, to figure out where God wanted me to be. I just started looking, well, that looks like a cool spot. Um, you know, I, that looks like a cool place to be. And it wasn't long before I heard from a church in the state of Wyoming. Now, we had a phone interview that's, this is before FaceTime and Skype, and so you, you had to do a phone interview, and, and it went really well. It, I was really excited, you know, new opportunity, go out to the frontier, go out to the mountains and all that fun stuff that's out there, and, you know, I, I didn't know what, really what Wyoming was. I thought the whole state was just like Yellowstone National Park, but that's just a little tiny portion. And so they invited Heather and I to go to Wyoming for an in-person interview, and we flew in a really big plane to Salt Lake City. And then we got into what I like to call a fun-sized plane from Salt Lake City to Sheridan, Wyoming. It's one of those planes where they look at you and say, we need you to move to the other side so that the weight is distributed better. If, you, if I'm ever in an aircraft where they need me to move to distribute the, the weight, I'm in the wrong plane. Like, I need your plane to be sturdier than that. But that was this airplane, like, sir, can you move to the other side? No. No. Um, so we landed, and there was this giant pile of snow that was pushed up on the side of the airstrip. I mean, like giant, like, like, like not house size, bigger than house size. It was one of those, they, they, they piled up this big pile of snow. I guess it probably has melted by now, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and there was nothing else. And when I say there was nothing, I mean, there literally was nothing else. If you've ever driven through Wyoming, you know what I'm talking about. It looked like we had landed on the surface of the moon. And as soon as our feet touched the tarmac, we had this overwhelming sense of dread like, dear God, what have we done? 
A couple from Georgia was there to pick us up, of all things. They moved out so that he could work in the pipeline industry, the, the petroleum industry there, and, and we got into their, their lunar rover. Now, it was actually disguised as an as a old Chevy Suburban, but it had to be a lunar rover because that's what you drive on the moon. And they drove us across this barren wasteland to Buffalo, Wyoming. And there they dropped us off at, their, at the hotel. And at first, it looked like they were taking us to the decent-looking Holiday Inn Express, but instead they took us to the less-than-decent hotel across the street. And I believe the hotel was a super seven and a half because it didn't quite qualify for that last half a point. Like, they leave the light on for you, but they couldn't afford the light bulb kind of place. And it wasn't the worst hotel I've ever stayed in, but it was definitely top five. It doesn't match that Red Roof Inn that we stayed in not too long ago. That one, that one took the cake. That one took the cake. It was pet friendly and anyway. So anyway, we both knew that we had committed a major error. But we were there and we decided to go through the process to see if the Lord had anything else to teach us through that whole process, through that whole ordeal. And even as we went through the process, it was very clear that we were trying to push God's hand rather than actually listen to God's voice. But what he taught us was very important. Even at your lowest place, God's not done with you yet. Even in your darkest of dark moments, God's not finished yet. My mistake is that I got it to that low place and I started trying to fix it because that's what our tendency is. I get to a dark place, I wanna fix it. I wanna get the lights on. I don't like being in a dark place. I need the lights to be turned on. But the tools that I was using to fix it were not the tools that God would have have me use to fix it. And ultimately, this is so what happens so often. We try, we, we're told to wait upon the Lord, but we get tired of waiting and we start frenetic, frenetically trying to make something happen. So I stopped listening to the Lord, I got impatient, and the Lord took me to the moon to teach me how to wait for him. We came back home with a brand new perspective, and I didn't send out any more resumes until it was clear that God was leading us to Chattanooga Valley Baptist Church many years later. Jeremiah chapter 37 and 38 represents the lowest point in Jeremiah's ministry. He didn't get sent to the moon, but he did get dropped in a cistern. But even in this low place in ministry, Jeremiah didn't do what I did. Jeremiah didn't take matters into his own hands. Jeremiah didn't take his eyes off the Lord. He maintained faithfulness. He continued to listen to God. And even as his ministry took a dark turn that actually nearly took his life, he continued to faithfully wait on the Lord. This morning, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 37 and 38. We'll cover both chapters. Most of our emphasis, though, is going to be in chapter 38. If you've got your Bibles with you today, I would invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 38, and I'm going to read just the first, uh, first few verses here in Jeremiah chapter 38. Would you stand with me if you're able in honor of reading God's Word? Now, Shephatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jukal, the son of uh, Shelemiah and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, the city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken then the official said to the king, let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who were left in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of the people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, behold, he's in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah, cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the, son, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Father, I thank you for your words here. I thank you for the lesson that Jeremiah teaches us, even from the bottom of a pit. I pray, Father, that you would help us as we all go through seasons where we find ourselves in dark places, maybe in, in spiritual pits, as Jeremiah was in a physical one. Help us to walk faithfully with you, even in those dark moments. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Backtracking just a little bit, this is a story that I've alluded to as we've talked through some of Jeremiah's prophecies. We, this is sort of what happens is Jeremiah has a lengthy prophetic section and then some narrative section here, and this narrative section goes along with some of the prophetic sections that we have talked about so far. 
And we know that there was a season in Jeremiah's ministry where it was spent in prison. And chapter 37 gives the details of how that imprisonment takes place. There was a a brief reprieve in, in, in the Babylonian siege. It turns out that the Egyptian army had marched into Israel and made a power play by doing so. And this caused the Babylonians to sort of freak out a little bit, and they decided to, uh, to break the, the siege to go intercept the Egyptians so that they wouldn't be caught in any kind of a flank situation or anything like that. And so as the siege is broken, there was some freedom of mobility that Jerusalem was able to experience during that time. And we're told in chapter 37, verse 12, that Jeremiah attempted to leave during that time because he needed to go to Benjamin to tend to some family business. It very likely has to do with that piece of property that he was asked to buy a few chapters ago. However, as he was leaving, he got stopped at the gate and accused of being a defector, a Benedict Arnold, if you will. He was, he was, he was accused of going to, to go to the Babylonians as, as kind of a spy. And the guard, we actually are told his name, Erijah is his name, he seized Jeremiah and he brought him to the authorities. They beat Jeremiah and they imprisoned him. If you hear images of what Jesus went through here, it's not an, an inaccurate thing to make some parallels here. It's a, you actually can see some, some similarities here. But while he was in jail, the king secretly continued to have meetings with Jeremiah because the king wasn't faithful, but he knew that Jeremiah was plugged into a power source that he didn't have access to. And so he, he sought opportunities to go and, and hear from Jeremiah. Maybe he'd, he'd glean a nugget of wisdom or maybe there'd be some warning that he could, he could take away. Even though he didn't trust Jeremiah and didn't follow the Lord, he was very much interested in what Jeremiah had to say. And, and again, this is a pattern we see in the Bible of other kings. Uh, I think of of uh, Joseph and Pharaoh, where Pharaoh brought Joseph in to, to, to sort of hear what, what the dreams were about, or, or Daniel and the, the Babylonian kings that he encountered. Uh, you know, we want to hear what your God has to say. And so this king is very much in that same spirit, but in spite of these audiences that he had with the king, he was never released from jail. But the whole time this is going on, Jeremiah's enemy list is growing. You know, he's, he's, he's building up more people who, who are tired of Jeremiah's words. And in chapter 38, we're introduced to a group of four co-conspirators. We've got a full-blown conspiracy here, and they have, they've had enough. They don't want to hear Jeremiah's prophecies anymore. They're ready to put him to death, and they're named. Uh, Shephatiah, Genaliah, Jucal, and Pasher. They're given these names. And interestingly enough, if you look in chapter 37, one of these co-conspirators is actually requesting for prayer. And so he's, a, he's really a, a double agent. In one hand, he's asking Jeremiah to pray for him, to intercede. And on the other hand, he's looking for opportunities to, to kill Jeremiah. But these men have had enough of all these unfriendly prophecies that the prophet was speaking. And they hatch a plan to silence the prophet for good. And the first thing we want to take away from this story is this. God's people should not be surprised when they don't get a very warm welcome from the world. Like, this should not surprise us when, when God's people encounter the world and the world says, hey, I don't know that I like what you guys represent. Jeremiah didn't have many friends, but his enemy list kept getting longer and longer. These four co-conspirators, they didn't have any kind of personal vendetta. They just didn't like what Jeremiah had to say. It wasn't like there was a family drama or anything like that. They were just sick of his message. And as a result, they were willing to get the prophet's blood on their hands. The catch is, is this pattern, though, it's been repeated throughout history of people not really caring what God has to say and being willing to take drastic measures. Some people love the word of God. Some people love what God has to say. But then again, there's a whole lot of people, a whole lot of folks who don't want to hear what God has to say. And they target the only agent that they can the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a 2018 book called Prejudice in the Press by George Yancey and Alicia Brunson. They find in this book that there is evidence that the media is less sympathetic to stories where Christians face hate speech or violence than identical stories where other groups are victimized. Social institutions such as, as, such as academia, media, entertainment, and the arts are likely to be places where anti-Christian prejudice and discrimination take place. These institutions greatly shape our cultural values, and thus those with anti-Christian attitudes are in a position to create and sustain anti-Christian perspectives. Now, that doesn't surprise us. We're, we're familiar with these things. We hear these things on a regular basis. This is part of our, of our modern story with modern media taking a negative approach to, to Christians and Christian stories and Christian interests. 
as Christian missions are, are indicted for being colonialist, that we're, instead of spreading the Christian gospel, we're, we're accused of, of trying to spread uh, Western ideals. And that's not the case at all. So again, this, this shouldn't surprise us, but this is the growing reality of the world in which we live. And it's been the reality for the last 2,000 years of Christianity because true Bible-believing Christians have been on the receiving end of a lot of discrimination, prejudice, and even persecution. Whether it's the persecution that so defined the church in the first 300 years of her existence. It's not until Constantine declares Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire that the persecution of the church began to be diminished. Of course, the Protestant reformers who sought to fight against the, the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church, they were met with death and persecution at the hands of the Roman Catholic uh, oppressors. And even today, in the darkest corners of our world where communism or Islam reigns supreme, we know that there are persecution of Christians unlike that's ever been experienced in history. We hear stories about Christians in Nigeria being kidnapped by these terrorist school, Christian schools in, in Africa being taken over by these, by these terrorist groups who are purposely targeting Christians who are seeking to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a very insulated and isolated part of the world where our, our freedom to worship, our freedom to practice our religion is, is well guarded and well protected. And so when I hear that, that uh, when Christians complain about that we're being persecuted in the United States, folks, we ain't being persecuted. There ain't no persecution happening in the United States of America. There may be some inconveniences and there may be targeted attacks on people like Jack Phillips and others who have been under the ire of, of certain organizations and institutions in this world. But as long as we have the freedom to gather in this place without armed guards or without threats of violence, we're not being persecuted. But there are parts of the world where it's happening where a gathering like this would be illegal and coming to a gathering like this would be something where you would take your life into your own hands. That is happening in the world today. However, we understand that there are political challenges that are being faced by Christians in Western democracies such as our own. And there is ample evidence to suggest that that trend is only going to continue. If you are in a workplace or a career today where your Christian faith is tolerated, you can count yourself blessed because we understand that the tide is turning as secularism continues to sp spread and expand in our world today. And so it shouldn't surprise us to see that the Christian faith is being pushed to the margins of our culture. After all, Jesus warned us in no uncertain terms in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations. For my name's sake. While that has certainly happened in fits and starts over the last 2,000 years, we've never seen a scenario where all the nations of the earth unite in their disdain for the church or their disdain for Christianity, but it's not difficult to imagine that scenario coming to pass with the widespread use of social media and an inter incredibly interconnected world as long as they're not using Microsoft computers. <clears throat> Back to Jeremiah. The co-conspirators who are out to get him have decided to bring their complaints to the king. For the record, King Zedekiah would thrive in today's political climate. He is the original flip-flopper to use the political language of some former elections. In Jeremiah chapter 37, he puts Jeremiah in jail, but he still called on him for spiritual advice. It was like he had a prophet in his back pocket. And here in chapter 38, he takes the counsel of these four men and he then authorizes a hit on Jeremiah. What is their reasoning for wanting to eliminate the prophet? Well, they say he's a national security risk. What? It's what it says right here in verse 38 or chapter 38, verse 4. Then the official said to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who were left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such word to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of the people, but their harm. Jeremiah's message has been consistent. The pathway, pay for the Lord, at this time for the people of Israel is to exile. That is the safe pathway for them. That is the only way that they will be safe. So undoubtedly there are some people who are listening to the prophet, but for those who remain, they're hearing the steady drumbeat of Jeremiah's main sermon. Babylon is the only way that you will be saved. Babylon is the only way that you will be saved. If you stay in Jerusalem, you're going to meet your demise. If you go to Egypt, you're going to meet your demise. A steady drumbeat of Jeremiah's preaching is all that has been heard for months and months and months and months. God is judging Judah. Babylon is going to win. 
What does that teach us? It teaches us that God's perspective on our situation can easily be seen as being bad for morale. We talked about this on Wednesday night. The gospel message, the message of the cross, requires that we be very honest with ourselves about ourselves. Because if you've got a high opinion of yourself, then you're going to find that the message of the cross, it absolutely obliterates the image that you have created about yourself. Because nobody can come to the cross with a sense of pride. The cross tells us that we are sinful. The cross tells us that we don't have a means to fix our sin problem. The cross tells us that we aren't enough. But you know what? That is not the message prevailing within our society today. Back in the early 90s, Al Franken played a recurring character on Saturday Night Live named Stuart Smalley. Anybody remember watching Stuart Smalley? All the sinners, raise your hand. The rest of you, I, it's like, I'm not supposed to acknowledge I stayed up late watching Saturday Night Live. Stuart Smalley was an effeminate self-help guru, and every skit would begin the exact same way. I deserve good things. I'm entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. I am an attractive person. I am fun to be with. I am good enough, I am smart enough, and there's my sinners, I got you. <laughs> Doggone it, people like me. That is the way that every single skit began. But what I have found is that what Saturday Night Live makes fun of in one generation becomes the norm in the next. And if we're honest, the cross doesn't allow for an inflated view of self. You can't go to the cross and look at the Savior who spills his blood for our sins and say, and doggone it, people like me. Well, the fact of the matter is that you're a sinner and you deserve what he's paying. You deserve the death that he is offering. That's what you deserve. And so all of the self-help mantras that you can chant don't actually do you any good when you stand before the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ because the only thing you can do at the cross is say, have mercy on me, a sinner. The bad morale is taking a toll on Jerusalem's defenders and residents. And so Jeremiah's enemies decide that they can't take it anymore. They can't hear all that negative talking, all that negative prophecy. They've got to get rid of Jeremiah, and they come up with an interesting way to get rid of the prophet. There were quicker ways, I'm sure, but instead it's clear that they very much want Jeremiah to suffer, and so they lower him down into a cistern. They don't drop him into a cistern. They don't push him off a cliff. They lower him via rope down into a cistern because they know that if they throw him into it, he might die immediately. It's 15 or 20 foot deep. It, it's not altogether guaranteed that he would survive such a fall. And we're told that there was no water in the cistern, just a thick layer of mud at the bottom. And so Jeremiah's rope is cut, and he finds himself sinking into the muddy bottom of a pit. Perhaps Jeremiah found himself in the mud, and the words from Psalm 69 were brought to mind. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. Verse 14, deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Jeremiah here reminds us that God cares about you even in your bleakest and darkest circumstances. He cares about you in the middle of the hardest moments of your life. He cares about you when you're driving across the moon in Wyoming wondering what you're going to do with your life. He cares about you in all of the dark places. In spite of the fact that Jeremiah found himself in a terrible situation, you can't help but consider the words that God had spoken over Jeremiah when he was called into the prophetic ministry. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 8? Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. When you're stuck in the mud at the bottom of a well, that really tends to test your feelings about God's promises at the time. When you're at your darkest place where there's no way of escape, where the only thing that you can see ahead of you is darkness and death because the light and the way of deliverance is too far out of reach. 
But I love this, that, that even as Jeremiah was struggling in his predicament, God already had a plan in motion to rescue the prophet. And Jeremiah didn't know this was happening, but he didn't need to know. What he needed to know was that God had not forgotten his promises to Jeremiah, even though his circumstances were absolutely abysmal. Listen, we need to remember that as well. We all go through hard seasons and hard times. If you're not yet, just hang on, it's coming. Some of those hard times, it's gonna be some of the hardest things you've ever been through. The, the season that you're approaching may be the most difficult season in your life. But listen, God is not finished with you. God is still working in you. He who began a good work in you is going to be faithful to bring it to completion. And even when you are at your lowest, God may already have the plans in motion for you to see his hand at work in the midst of the darkness. And if you're not going through a difficult season today, it's good to consider these things before you get there so you'll know how to respond when the time comes. God made his plan for Jeremiah aware the day that he was called into the prophetic ministry. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you can bank on the precious promises that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Even in the middle of your darkest moments, his promises are intact. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's going to complete the good work that he began in you. Listen again to the psalmist. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. What plan did God have for the prophet? While he was at the bottom of the well, waist deep in mud, a man named Ebed Melech was paying attention. Now, what do we know about this guy? Another, another hero of the Old Testament that doesn't get any credit. Well, we don't know much about him, but what we do know tells us that he was the most unlikely of saviors. We're told that he was an Ethiopian. He's a foreigner, and so as a foreigner in Israel, he didn't have a whole lot of authority to begin with. It's very likely that he was a slave in that capacity. We're told that he was a eunuch, which, kids, if you don't know what that is, ask your parents. But what I can tell you is that he's been subject to some significant torture and suffering in his own life. He's been a victim of a lot of pain and misery in his life. And it's very likely he didn't even have his own name. You say, Pastor, you said his name was Ebed Melech. Ebed Melech in Hebrew simply means this, servant of the king. And so it's very likely that whatever name he brought into slavery was replaced with a simple designation, Ebed Melech, servant of the king. And so it's very likely, based on what we know about him, that he was a slave, and he was probably in charge of the king's harem. And for all intents and purposes, Ebed Melech, the servant of the king, he didn't count for anything. But in God's story, people who don't count for much can do amazing things. And in God's story, Ebed Melech mattered. Because after all, Jeremiah was not just a prophet to Israel. God appointed him as a prophet to the nations. And when Ebed Melech the Ethiopian heard the word of the Lord from Jeremiah, it did not leave him unaffected. And so Ebed Melech goes to the king, takes a major risk. He confronts the king, like a tr and like a true politician, the king changed his mind. He flip flopped. And he gave Ebed Melech permission to go get Jeremiah out of the cistern. Verse 10. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, take 30 men with you from here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed Melech took the men with him, went to the house of the king, to a wardrobe in the storehouse, and there he took old rags and worn out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. And then Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, put the rags and cloths between your armpits and the ropes, and Jeremiah did so. What a detail. I mean, like, what a detail that God includes this for us. He didn't have to include this for us, that, that Ebed Melech was so thoughtful that he went to the Goodwill and he got a bunch of old clothes so that Jeremiah could actually not be injured in the rescue attempt. I love that detail because it tells us just, just how accurate this is, that that level of detail is included for us. And, and it shows us an incredible picture of concern that Ebed Melech has for Jeremiah. He didn't want to cause Jeremiah more pain so he collected the materials he needed to save Jeremiah from more suffering. Again, just this surprising little detail that shows us just how much Ebed Melech respected Jeremiah. 
And I'll say this, Ebed Melek shows us that you never know who's watching your faithfulness. You never know who's watching your faithfulness. How you handle life when you're stuck in whatever mud you find yourself in really does matter because you don't know who's watching. In this case, Jeremiah faced his dark time by faithfully following the Lord. And of course, we've seen how Jeremiah's faithfulness had made him some enemies, but it turns out that it also made him some friends. His enemies tried to take his life, but these new friends sought to save him. Yeah, I'm reminded of Paul and Silas when they were stuck in the prison in Philippi. They were in the solitary confinement in the inner prison, and they're in stocks, and it's a miserable situation. I can't imagine how miserable it must have been. They were stuck in their own version of the mud. This time it was stocks, though. And instead of giving up on God in the middle of the trial, instead of saying, forget it, we're done, I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore, instead, as they are in the stocks and they are in misery and they are facing a dark moment, what do they do? They worship God in the middle of the trial. They worship God in the middle of the crisis. They worship God in the middle of the mud. And when God freed them, the other prisoners, it wasn't like jailbreak where everybody scattered. Instead, all the prisoners stay put because the prisoners were watching Paul and Silas suffer and they were inspired as they watched Paul and Silas suffer. They saw their faithfulness and it changed them. When you're facing hardship, there are any number of ways that you can deal with your hardship. Some sinful, some faithful. But you need to know this. If you claim to follow Jesus, then your testimony during trials is one of the most compelling visions that you can cast for the kingdom of God. How you suffer will be a testimony to others that may be the most compelling thing you can do. Hopefully you'll never be stuck in the mud at the bottom of a cistern. But one day you might be stuck in the mud at the hospital. One day you might be stuck in the mud at the funeral home. One day you might be stuck in the mud at the unemployment office. You're going to be stuck in the mud at some point in time. How do you respond? Well, it turns out that God had some good things in store for Eben Melek. We're told over in chapter 39, verse 15. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Eben Melech the Ethiopian, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid, for I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword but you shall have your life as a prize of war because you've put your trust in me, declares the Lord. Jeremiah handled the mud just fine and Eben Melech watched him suffer and Eben Melech listened to the word of God and Eben Melech was delivered by God's faithfulness. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to know this. God has good things in store for you. Now, this isn't some sort of prosperity gospel teaching where if you'll just do the right things, good things will happen to you, that if you'll just believe the right things, you'll never suffer. If you just give the right amount of money, you'll have prosperity that follows you everywhere. That's not what this is. But truth be told, the good things that God has promised for you, they may not manifest in this life. There are plenty of faithful people who have served the Lord faithfully, who have suffered their entire life. You may know people who love and serve and worship Jesus who are in the middle of suffering and their suffering has taken them to the end of their days. But the promises of God, God's good things that he has for you, they may not come to pass in this life. The circumstances around Jerusalem did not change during this episode. Babylon was still at the gate. Destruction was still imminent. But God honored Ebed Melech for his faithfulness. One of my favorite passages is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. And the Apostle Paul says this. It's just a reminder of how this life is. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
for this light momentary affliction is preparing us, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I want you to hear this. Paul is not diminishing your suffering. Paul is not diminishing your trial. He is not making light of that diagnosis. He is not making light of that job situation. He is not making light of that family crisis. He is not diminishing your trial. But he is making a distinction between our struggles in this life in light of eternity. And what he is saying is that the struggles that we face in this life in the light of eternity are going to seem like but a moment. You say, Pastor, I can't take it anymore. That's okay. In light of eternity, you can take it. You can take it. You can take it today. You can take it tomorrow. And you can take it to the next. Because in the light of what God has promised you, in the light of what God has offered you, you are facing but a momentary light of affliction that will prepare for you an eternal weight of glory that is beyond your wildest imaginations. What God has for you is unimaginable and and, and incredible. And so whatever affliction you face today, know that God's glory is prepared for you tomorrow. And while we may be stuck in the mud, while we may be stuck in the mud for even an indefinite period of time, The promise of God says that, Christian, there is glory in your future. The task for us, this side of glory, is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to continue to watch for his hand at work, even in the middle of our darkest hours, and to trust him today, knowing the provisions he's prepared for us tomorrow. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of faithful men like Jeremiah whose, whose lives were marked by difficulties, but who in the middle of their difficulties continued to be faithful to serve you. Father, I pray that you would help us in the challenges that we face, Lord, whether they be imminent or whether they be in our future. Lord, wherever we find ourselves, I pray that you might help us to walk faithfully with you and bear witness to your grace for those around us. Thank you, God, for your care for us and how you extend it to us day after day after day. And so, Lord, even if we find ourselves stuck in the mud today, when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, May we look to the light, knowing that a Savior is coming soon. Father, I pray for those who are hurting today that you might provide them comfort. I pray for those who are facing what seems absolutely insurmountable, whether it be something with their health, something in their family, something in their career, something even beyond those things, that in the middle of those darkest, hardest moments, that their eyes would be fixed on Jesus. And Lord, I pray today that if there's any in this room, any watching online who aren't following Jesus, they're in the middle of a dark place and they have no savior to give them hope They have no hope of tomorrow because the only thing that they know is the darkness of their soul. I pray that in the middle of that dark place that the Son of God might make himself known and that they would see the cross and they would see what Jesus did on the cross and they would recognize that there is a Savior who loves them, there is a Savior who wants to walk with them even through the valley of the shadow of death, but that they would see the cross and that they would see the Savior who took their place and they would surrender their life to Jesus. So God, in these next few moments, I ask that you move. Regardless of what our situation is, what our season is, may we faithfully and humbly follow you. And if there's any here today that need to cry out to you for salvation, 
May today be the day in which you make yourself known to them. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name.